Marx, Engels, and Communism. Marx and Engels enunciated a theory of history as exploitation. History occurred in stages, each better than its predecessor, each with its appropriate economic system, with change triggered by class conflict that each economic system bred within itself. The 19th century world was in a capitalist stage, but inevitably capitalism would give way to another economic system with another dominant class. As feudalism had brought about the rise of capitalists who overthrew feudalism in favor of capitalism, so capitalism was creating a working class that would overthrow capitalism in favor of a worker-run economy, the extreme form of socialism known as communism. Marx and Engels had trouble being taken seriously. The entire socialist intellectual movement, composed of middle and capitalist class idealists and intellectuals, lacked the numbers to generate a serious socialist movement. That came from the working people, enamored of simplified versions of the socialist ideas. Probably the majority of the 19th century labor movements were socialist in aims, using unionism as a means to an end. Even 20th century labor unions even in the United States had elements of socialism in their platforms, but they gained only small victories. They had little success in nationalizing mines, railroads, and other industries. Capitalists reinforced the labor socialist tie by attempting to suppress all labor movements, rather than drawing distinctions between the milder forms of labor organizing and the socialist movement. Socialists and communists welcomed the capitalist accusations that they were revolutionaries. This oppression would encourage the poor, insecure, workers, downtrodden by the capitalist business cycle, to join forces and press for radical change. Numbers alone would make them a force the capitalist rulers would have to confront and suppress, probably by abandoning all pretense of democracy. The masses would rise and overthrow the capitalist system. At least that was the Marxist dream. The revolutions never happened. Despite the odds, labor movements fought the uphill battle against capitalists, governments, militaries, and police some died, but the others won the shorter working day, higher wages, and better working conditions. The average worker had a stake in the system rather than a desire to overthrow it. It did not help that capitalism became more adept at producing cheap and abundant if inferior goods and brought about a higher standard of living. Most workers in the second half of the 19th century were living better than their parents. Revolutions did break out in 1848, but they were not socialist. The International Working Men's Association, the first international, came into being only in 1864. Strongly Marxist, it was dominant in European socialism. Marx's International Workingmen's Association had its first meeting at Geneva in 1866. This was the first major international socialist meeting. It reflected the general socialist tendency to disagree on strategy. Marx and Engels and British and exiled continental labor leaders created the International Workingmen's Association in 1864. It was a committee, and about as effective as committees normally are it included British reformists, continentals of more radical persuasion, and anarchists of several types. Marx relocated headquarters to New York to strip away the anarchists. The IWA dissolved in 1876. By century's end, Marxist socialism was the leading ideology of working class parties in all but the Britain and the United States. Socialism rose from a small intellectual movement to a large mass working class political movement coincident with the industrialization of Europe, particularly between 1870 and 1890, which created the great proletariat. The centenary of the French Revolution in 1889 was the occasion for socialists and social democrats to meet in Paris and form the Second International. The Second International was a confederation of centralized national parties. The approach was popularized by Engels, August Babel of the German Social Democratic Party, and Karl Koskai. Socialism had a shining moment from March 18 to May 28, 1871, when the Paris Commune arose in the aftermath of France's loss to Prussia and the collapse of the Second Empire. The city's citizens elected a radical government composed of old Jacobins from 1789 and Proudhonites. Communes arose in Toulouse, Marseille, Saint-Étienne, and Lyon but were suppressed quickly. The Versailles government sent the army against Paris and repressed the Commune. The Commune accomplished little but became a symbol remarked on by Marx, it was evidence to many socialists that the working class was ready for the revolution. American Socialism the U.S. Socialist Labor Party of America came into being in 1877. Already small, it fragmented in the 1890s. In 1901 the Socialist Labor Party's moderate faction and the Social Democratic Party and Eugene V. Debs put together the Socialist Party of America. American socialism differed from European and British socialisms because Americans' experiences were not those of the old countries. 
the American labor movement struggled in the 19th century, even later when industrialism was rampant and highly exploitive, because American workers were slow to acknowledge that they were no longer free agents, self-employed craftsmen, and entrepreneurs in the making. Socialism's emphasis on cooperation rather than rugged individualism seemed un-American. Socialism's American beginnings were imported, primarily from Germany. It remained strongly influenced by immigrants Milwaukee's gas and water socialist Victor Berger, the leadership of the anarchist industrial workers of the world, and many of the National Party leaders. Where socialism had native roots, it tended to arise from populist farmers whose socialism tracked more closely with their Christianity than with any imported European ideas. When Oklahoma voted for socialists before World War I, it did so because of agricultural conditions in Oklahoma, not out of commitment to the Second International. European Socialism Edward Bernstein and the Social Democrats Vladimir dominated the Second International in 1889 in Paris. Vladimir Lenin and Germany's Rosa Luxemburg led the radicals. Karl Koskai led a smaller faction. The anarchists were left out and split from the socialist movement. In 1884 British middle-class intellectuals formed the Fabian Society, which laid the basis for the Labour Party in 1906. Jean Georges founded the Section Française de l'Internationale Ouvrière in 1905. Under Weres and later Leon Blum the SFIO kept Marxist theory while in practice becoming reformist. In Germany, Ferdinand Lassala advocated voluntary worker cooperatives rather than Marx's revolution. Marx was scornful, but Lassala's cooperatives were the beginnings of today's credit unions, mutual insurance companies, food cooperatives, and similar institutions. They have never altered capitalism but have found a niche within it. The German Social Democratic Party, founded on the ideas of Marx and Lassalle, was for decades the world's leading socialist organization. By 1891 it had a million and a half members and was beginning to enjoy reasonable electoral success. Although Karl Koskai kept the German Social Democratic Workers' Party Marxist in doctrine, in practice the party became reformist rather than revolutionary. Success meant that, despite rhetoric of revolution, the party found itself absorbed into the conventional political process. In Great Britain, the Marxist critique failed to take hold. Rather the approach was gas and water socialism, under the Fabian Society. It began on January 4, 1884, when members of the Fellowship of the New Life took a political approach to the Fellowship's goal of the transformation of society by setting an example of simple, clean living. The Fellowship faded, and the Fabians drew members such as Sidney and Beatrice Potter Webb, H.G. Wells, and George Bernard Shaw. These were elite reformers who felt that socialism could transform society by slow penetration of its principles into the fabric of capitalist society. They had no interest and perhaps no true awareness of class politics, including labor unions and labor parties. The driving force was the Webbs, who wrote the bulk of the studies of Britain's industrial system and alternative policies for capital and land. The Fabian Society was named for Roman general Quintus Fabius Maximus, Cunctator, or Delayer who fought through harassment and attrition rather than head-on confrontations. Fabians were against free trade but supported nationalist foreign policy in South Africa. They were significant in the establishment of the Labour Party in 1900. They advocated government ownership of utilities and land and other resources, but they insisted that all changes come through law rather than revolution. Socialism and Nationalism In the late 19th century the various socialist groups became increasingly nationalistic. Universal male suffrage became common in the Western world during the first decades of the 20th century. Socialism became increasingly tied to labor unions and labor parties, which increasingly mobilized the working class vote. As socialists got access to power, they became more pragmatic, recognizing that they still needed the middle and wealthy classes to achieve their aims. Those classes still owned the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And the welfare state made the workers' lives better, delaying the revolution. The involvement of socialists with government split the parties into moderates and radicals in the 20th century. Edward Bernstein represented the moderates who thought that the reforms could come through the democratic political process. This was the basic social democracy. Communists in countries without a parliamentary democracy argued for revolution, Vladimir Lenin argued this path. In 1903 the Russian social democrats split into Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. By the early 20th century, Germany's Social Democratic Party had abandoned the revolutionary goal completely and backed Kaiser Wilhelm, in the process destroying its credibility with foreign socialist movements. The other socialist parties backed their governments one by one, destroying the international working class movement in a wave of nationalism. 
The American Socialist Party was the exception in refusing to back the war, but it was a weak organization nationally and internationally, never able to win more than 6% of the vote. Marx and other socialists ignored or discounted working class differences of nationality, religion, ethnicity, and gender. These were factors that the capitalists exploited to divide and weaken the workers. For socialists, the real division was between a unified, homogeneous working class and a unified capitalist class. As reality intruded during the 19th century era of socialism, intrusion of nationalism and other differences forced the socialists to adjust their doctrine to keep it relevant to workers who were also male and female members of ethnic, national, and religious communities. Socialism won out over anarchism and other ideas within the working class movement because it was better organized and had a more realistic political strategy. It fit nicely with the alienated workers of the large factories and plants of 19th century capitalism, workers more prone to alienation and more susceptible to pitches about solidarity than were the workers of the small crafts industries of early industrialism. Socialism also demphasized millenarianism, stressing instead a better tomorrow in the here and now with tangible bread and butter results. Until the Russian Revolution, no one had any way of measuring the validity or effectiveness of the socialist promises of economic equality and fairness for all. Social Democrats had better success than socialists did. They were more gradualist, advocating high taxes to promote relative equality, government regulation, nationalization as necessary, and social welfare. Scandinavia was most successful with this approach, but other European countries adapted some elements. Late in the 20th century and early in the 21st, governments began dismantling at least parts of these social democracies.